Donald, and welcome to another program on spirituality. Uh, this is a program I've been looking forward to for quite a long time. Um, this is the Society of Our Lady of the Most Holy Trinity, and this is a society that started right here in New Mexico many years ago, and it's a great opportunity to talk about it and share some with it. Many of you who watch EWTN are probably familiar with uh, Father Carapi, who is a member of this society. And, but here we have some, some local folks, folks that are working now currently in the field here in New Mexico, and you probably won't get a chance to see them unless you happen to catch this on television. So call your friends, tell them to turn on the television because we're gonna introduce you to a homegrown society <laughs> and uh, here in the Roman Catholic Church, and we're happy to have you. So welcome, Father Thank Dennis you. and Sister Mary of the Eucharist. Welcome here. Thank Great. You. Thank you. Um, we, as I said before, uh, this is one of the very few, I think one of only two uh, religious orders that have started here in New Mexico, and I believe that was what year? 1958. 1958. Yes, yeah. with Archbishop uh, Edwin Byrne. Yeah. So I'm serious. Call your friends right now, particularly the old timers, and tell them to turn on the television and watch this program because uh, there's some wonderful old footage of Archbishop Byrne and of your founder, Father Flanagan, and some others. And so we're going to go to that in just a couple of minutes and, uh, and uh, for you to, to get a little history here. Before I want to introduce our guest, Father, tell us your name and where you're from. Uh, my name, Bill, is Father Michael Jordan, and uh, my family home is in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Yeah. And I'm presently serving as pastor of St. Gertrude's Parish in uh, Mora, New Mexico. Yeah, and how did you come to the society? Well, I came originally as a lay apostle, and uh, at the time that uh, I joined uh, Our Lady Society, we had transferred our mother house from Santa Fe Archdiocese to Kansas City, Missouri uh, Diocese, and I, I initially joined the society there as a lay, as a lay apostle. Mm -hmm. And after three years, then, with the help of the spiritual direction offered in the society, I uh, acceded to God's call to the priesthood. So I prepared for the priesthood uh, as a seminarian of the Society of Our Lady. That's great. And Sister, your family originated from New Mexico, didn't they? Yes, indeed, in, in the uh, St. Gertrude's Parish, yeah. Mora Valley. My grandparents were living at the time of the foundation. Of course, Father Flanagan and Father John McHugh, co-founder, were pastors. Uh -huh. So they were their pastors. And I came to the society because I came to visit my grandparents. And I was given the hook. <laughs> That's how it works, doesn't it? <laughs> they all say the religion is not taught, it's caught. <laughs> I believe that. So, um, and I understand one of the interesting charisms of the society is you work in teams. Is that correct? Correct. Priests, sisters, deacons, and uh, lay people, uh, married and single. Mm -hmm. And many of their children, we have to count them as they're a part of the team, too. They yeah. do um, interrelate very beautifully. Yeah. So, uh, and tell the folks, on what is your name? What is your given name? My given name is Lillian Romero. And, and the name that you've taken or was given the, to you? The Holy Spirit gave me Sister Mary of the Holy Eucharist. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. And I wouldn't let anyone take it back. Okay. All right, tell us, before we go to the tape, tell us just uh, in your own words, uh, what is the mission of the society and how did the Holy Spirit create it here? Well, take a stab at it. Um, as the, the vision for the, for the work of our community ever since its inception was that we would serve whatever particular mission or apostolate throughout the world uh, to bring all peoples into union with the Trinity through the discipleship of Jesus and Mary. And so our spirituality is a spirituality of discipleship and we look to our, our Blessed Mother uh, as the model of all disciples and we see especially her relationship with the triune God as beloved daughter of the Father and devoted mother of the Son and faithful obedient spouse of the Holy Spirit. We see her living that discipleship and entering into that communion of the Trinity uh, the most fully of any human being and so we want to strive with the help of God's grace that, to that same you know relationship with God 
Okay. So uh, sit back. Uh, this video we're going to see right now will be about 15 minutes exactly. And uh, call your friends. I hope you've already called them because some wonderful old footage of early New Mexico when the, this society was started up in Mora Valley, uh, where Sister's family is from, the Romeros are from, and others. And I think you'll get a, a wonderful background, not only of the history also, but where they have gone, where the Holy Spirit has led this society in such a relatively short period of time. They're all over the place and doing some wonderful work. So, Doreen, please run that tape, and we'll be back in a few minutes, and we'll finish up after this tape. So sit back and enjoy it. This is a presentation of the historical evolution of the Society of Our Lady of the Most Holy Trinity. The concept of following Jesus Christ after the example of Mary in relationship with the Trinity moved Father James Flanagan to seek permission to establish a religious society with ecclesial teams of priests, religious, and laity at the time of his ordination to the priesthood, January 10th, 1952. The secretary to Richard Cardinal Cushing, Bishop Lawrence Riley, advised Father Flanagan to spend five years in the priesthood working in the pastoral ministry of the archdiocese before attempting to implement this work in the church. Father Flanagan served several parishes in the Boston Diocese until 1957. During these years of parish ministry, Father Flanagan began meeting regularly with a group of laity whose first concern focused on their own spiritual formation. Later, this deepened to a calling to serve Our Lady Society as lay apostles and religious. In 1957, two of these original laity, Alice Deneen and Therese Farrell, made a pilgrimage to the shrine of Our Lady of Guadalupe in Mexico City. Desiring to place themselves at the service of the church in a mission area, they stopped on their return trip at Santa Fe, New Mexico, where they visited Archbishop Edwin V. Byrne. The Archbishop responded positively to their request and assigned the group to work with the Franciscan Fathers on the Indian Reservation at Peña Blanca, New Mexico. After this experience proved satisfactory, Archbishop Byrne asked Father Flanagan to come from Boston to assume the spiritual direction of the group. He was assigned to work in the Immaculate Heart of Mary Parish with Father John McHugh at Holman, New Mexico in the Mora Valley. This was on December 8, 1957. On July 16, 1958, Archbishop Byrne established the Society of Our Lady of the Most Holy Trinity as a pious society until such time as it might evolve to a different canonical status. Those who wish to enter the religious state and those who wish to continue as lay apostles were closely linked in community living, spiritual formation, and apostolic action. The Congregation of the Daughters of Wisdom were called upon to guide the sisters in religious formation. The first candidates, Anna Kiernan and Anne Mansfield, continue to serve today within the society as Sister Mary of the Incarnation and current sister servant, Sister Mary of the Redemption. Archbishop Byrne officiated at the ceremony of their first profession on December 8, 1960. From the very inception of Salt, Archbishop Byrne gave permission for the incorporation of lay apostles, both single and married, into the society's community life and work. Many volunteers joined the work. Schools, health clinics, religious education programs, and service projects developed as volunteers flocked to serve the church. The area extended over 500 square miles of northwestern New Mexico. Summer brought hundreds of college volunteers who, after a week of orientation, were sent to parishes in these areas to live among the people as they served them. Some returned for permanent commitment to the laity. Some went on to religious life. Others went on to finish college degrees and to enter seminaries. Archbishop Byrne, who had taken a personal interest in the society, died July 25, 1963. 
his loss was deeply felt. Salt no longer prospered in the Santa Fe diocese. It was decided in April of 1964 to seek another diocese in which the work could mature until it received a canonical approval. At the invitation of Bishop Charles Helmsing, Bishop of Kansas City St. Joseph in Missouri, Father Flanagan took residence in Kansas City. The community followed and was re-established as a pious society on June 6, 1964 by Bishop Helmsing. Ecclesial teams were formed and developed to serve in areas of communication, medical and hospital ministry, criminal justice, educational research, teaching and social work. Human Rescue, a hotline for suicide prevention was established and remains an active agency to this day. Dismas House, a halfway house providing treatment and counseling for ex-offenders, recently celebrated its 25th anniversary. Children's Place, a Montessori grade school served the society families and the poor in Kansas City. An extension of Montessori education was started in the rural area of Eudora, Kansas. This facility extends through high school. It has placed its graduates in Catholic colleges such as Dallas University. A recent graduate is enrolled in a college seminary. Children's Place is now looking for a larger facility in the Kansas City area. Programs for the resettlement of Vietnamese refugees were administered by SALT, who processed and served over 50 refugee families of our Asian brothers and sisters. The John Bosco Center is currently continuing the work. Despite various reverses through the years, SOLT has steadily progressed to the point where it was necessary to seek a more permanent relationship with the hierarchy. Legal framework was necessary to receive public recognition within the Universal Church. Father Flanagan pursued various canonical structures. By December of 1996, canonical approval was granted to the Priest Society of Apostolic Life, Sisters Society of Apostolic Life, and the Public Clerical Association of Christian Faithful. Bishop Rainey Gracida provided over each of the ceremonies. Following this, in 1997, the process for pontifical canonical status had begun. In 1963, an ecclesial team of Our Lady Society began the work of serving migrant workers and their families in the sacramental ministry and corporal works of mercy. This apostolate began under the leadership of the Most Reverend Rainey H. Gracida of Corpus Christi, Texas. It continues today as the team follows the migrants through central United States from May to October. Daily Mass is celebrated. Children are prepared for the sacraments of First Holy Communion and Confirmation. Marriages are prepared to be blessed within the church, as well as caring for the migrants' personal needs and health care. Bishop Robert Gonzalez of Corpus Christi continues to sponsor this program. In 1967, a salt mission began when three lay members of Our Lady Society were sent to work in Belize, Central America as a medical team. Dr. Larry and Joanne Nacy, and Camilla La Coco, Father John McHugh followed in 1969. Sisters Mary Teresa and Mary Ann, along with Deacon Cal Cathers, his spouse Jenny and their family, accompanied Father John, who took over the pastoral care of Our Lady of Mount Carmel in Benque Viejo del Carmen. Currently, the team provides education for more than 1,500 local children from grade school through high school. Volunteer teachers and administrative personnel from the United States staff the schools. This team also serves the surrounding villages on both sides of the border with medical clinics and evangelization programs. On the Guatemalan side, in town of Melchor, Sisters provide religious education programs and care for the area's orphans. A successful printing business started in the early 1990s has become the largest employer of skilled personnel in the town of Benque. In 1975, Salt went to serve in the Philippine Islands at the invitation of Bishop 
Timoteo Passis of Legaspi. This mission has grown to become the society's largest mission. Father Thomas Gear developed this work resulting in over 30 ordained priests, over 50 men in the seminary, and many women religious and laity. Members of SOLT administer the Children's International Fund, an American organization which funds special education and development programs for children. In 1978, SOLT established a drug rehabilitation center in Ratchaburi, Thailand. Sister Mary Rose and Sister Mary of the Redemption, together with several native sisters, developed a center for women and a center for men. As an extension of this apostolate, a home for the care of abandoned men afflicted with AIDS was opened in Bangkok by Brother Rick Bunch of Seoul. In 1985, Seoul arrived in Cologne, Mexico, caring for neglected and abandoned children. The team also provides a basic needs for the abandoned elderly. In May of 1986, Father Flanagan led the Society's Priest Council to the Archdiocese of Boston to ready the documentations for Rome. In 1989, Bishop Rainey Gracida asked to sponsor the Society of Our Lady in Corpus Christi, Texas. San Jose House in Robstown, Texas is headquarters for SALT. St. Anthony's Parish and Grade School Numerous social programs and services are offered through this parish. San Jose Parish is also staffed by SOLT. Our Lady's Development Office and Comunio Headquarters are located at the San Jose House. Trinity House for priests and seminarians and Vez House for volunteers are a part of the team. Our Lady's priests serve many parishes in the area. The Haiti mission began in 1989 to work among the poor in the Diocese of Hinch. The work includes elementary education, nutritional programs, medical services, and spiritual programs. Haiti consists of some of the world's severest poor. In 1989, a center for vocational formation was begun in Belen, New Mexico. Headed by Father Santan Pinto, this team specializes in retreats for the lay faithful as disciples of Jesus and Mary, extending throughout the United States. In 1991, Solt began a mission in the Diocese of Nuevo Laredo, Mexico. Father Bob Rank provided sacramental ministry to the area. The sisters that followed instituted programs of preparation for the children and adults to receive the sacraments. Catechesis, Bible study, corporal works of mercy for the poor of the barrios, and a medical clinic are ongoing programs. Volunteers from the Disciples of Jesus and Mary in the United States assist in these programs. In 1993, Father Tom Gear of Salt began work in Papua New Guinea. Many apostolic programs and pastoral services have been implemented. Rural outstations are served by the team who operate elementary schools, teach catechetics, and conduct specialized retreats to seminary groups, sisters, and youth. In 1995, a mission to the Chippewa Indians was started in St. Anne's Parish in Belcourt, North Dakota, located in the beautiful Turtle Mountains. It continues under the leadership of Father Dale Craig. In 1996, Two missions were established in England. Father Gene Hart, an American, took over pastorship of Our Lady of Good Counsel Church in Hythe. Father Robert Copsey, an Englishman, took over pastorship of St. Mary Magdalene's Church in Brockley, London. In 1996, in San Antonio, Texas, an evangelization team began serving the Hispanics of the area. An evangelization team in Sacramento, California is active in teaching the new catechism and enlisting new members as Marian helpers through programs of spiritual formation and prayer commitments. In a small mountain village near Rome, Italy, Father Peter Fremont Smith began a formation program for a group of salt seminarians. Sister Anne Walsh, together with two other sisters and several postulants, join the team in Subiaco. Other programs have begun and ended for various reasons. We wait for a better time. On the occasion of the 25th anniversary of Our Lady Society, 
Father Flanagan shared a vision regarding higher education for SALT. As a fulfillment of that vision, the University of Our Lady of Corpus Christi will open its doors in September of 1998 at the Farmer Bishop Drury Retreat Center. This facility will be affiliated with the Franciscan University in Steubenville, Ohio. Many future programs are planned, as well as the expansion of existing programs. We ask Our Lady of the Most Holy Trinity to increase our numbers and bless her work in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Welcome back. Does that bring back memories from? It certainly does, yes. Uh, Very happy ones. Yeah. Tell us some of the things that you noticed in there. Were, uh, where you're living now in St. Gertrude's Parish, was that? That was indicated? correct. Uh, yeah. There wasn't too much on it. The pictures of the churches, but yes, in the very early days there, we see some of the, we refer to them now as our form, former members. Uh -huh. One of the things that occurred to me when they were showing the pictures is an expression my grandmother made in regard to these ladies, and one was that they were very noble women, you know, muy nobles, mm -hmm. and uh, that's truly what they are, no, noble. And did you meet many of the early women all founders? Of them. You did. You all, all of them. Yeah. I came in 1961, and they came a couple of years after. Uh, a couple of them in the picture were present at the same time I was, mm -hmm. and both are in heaven now. Mm -hmm. One became a sister and one became a deacon's wife. Oh, well we serve in many different ways, <laughs> it seems like. How about you, Father, what, uh, what, what struck out for you or stuck out for you in the, in the tape? Well, for the most part, uh, the early days of the society, of course, I wasn't aware of them at the time. I've just come to be aware of them since my joining the society, which was in 1976. Mm -hmm. However, um, Interestingly, I grew up in Our Lady of Fatima Parish in Albuquerque, and one of the priests mentioned, you know, as a kind of a co-founder with, uh, with Father Flanagan, is Father John McHugh. Well, Father John McHugh had an older sister who uh, resided in Our Lady of Fatima Parish with her family, and so oftentimes Father McHugh and Father Flanagan were coming to Our Lady of Fatima Parish, even offering mass <laughs> in the uh, school building where where I was going through my elementary uh, school, year, school years, and yeah. uh, his sister was also a personal friend of my, of my mother. So mm -hmm. I was linked to the society without knowing it, you know, <laughs> through those years of yeah. my childhood. But it was, I, I was in my late 20s when I mm -hmm. met a priest of the society who was assigned, uh, uh, you know, from our, our, from our mother house. He was sent to New Mexico uh, specifically to begin the work of uh, of uh, finding a appropriate and a suitable piece of land and mm -hmm. possibly doing some building so we could establish a formation center in the desert. So what we have now in Bosque, New Mexico, south of Belen, uh, a formation center where Father Pinto has been serving as our novice servant since 1989, that was the originally started by another uh, former priest of our community, Father Jim Doherty, who had come to the Archdiocese at the direction of Father Flanagan and mm -hmm. with the permission of uh, the bishop at that time, Bishop Archbishop Davis. Mm -hmm. He was uh, temporarily um, you know, serving in the Archdiocese and doing this work of establishing a formation center which has served very wonderfully for more than, um, well, 13 years now uh, as a uh, novitiate for our seminarians. Mm -hmm. Before I forget, I, I am indebted to Father McHugh, as you mentioned, who helped put this together and unfortunately was unable to be here at the last minute. And also I want to mention uh, Nikki Sullivan, who provided us with the tape and a lot of the background information, and all the other members that have been very gracious in helping us bring this together. Um, we will be doing, this will be a two-part uh, segment. We're uh, starting it with the videotape and uh, with Sister Mary the Holy Eucharist and, and Father Michael to begin the program and to start it. And then in next week's program, we'll have some other members of the society who will, who will share uh, some more and, and currently what, uh, what you are doing and what the society is really all about. But I, I was fascinated by seeing the old pictures of, of Archbishop Byrne and, and how readily welcome he, he made the founders. But before we forget, we should really talk a little bit about Father Flanagan. Uh, the tape gave a little bit of information. And he's still active in the society, is that correct? Yeah. Yes, he is. Yeah. Yes, yes, he is. 
He, at present, as far as I know, he's in uh, the Philippines doing probably formation of our seminarians mm -hmm. or young priests. Mm -hmm. But he has never stopped, always, always. And his yeah. time is, is totally consumed. Well, tell us, I mean, it's I, one of the reasons I invited you, and of course we wanted to let the folks in New Mexico know that the, this order has started here in New Mexico, it is here again, and is here flourishing and doing a lot of wonderful ministry. What's it like to be in a brand new order? I mean, uh, you know, we're so used to seeing the established orders here, but you're, you're really pioneers in the church. Yes, it would seem so. <laughs> um, I, I would say that we began before Vatican Council too, and uh, so that we started off with some very uh, strict rulings, as most communities had. Mm -hmm. But uh, we didn't have such a transition to make because we were that young. And, uh, and through the graciousness of Archbishop Davis, we ended up in an inner city situation from the mountains and uh, put right into the service of the church in the inner city, which was a very great developmental situation for us and um, how so sister? well because you started rural we started rural and we started as some would uh, call it a semi-contemplative situation we lived in silence and as I said lived more of the um, early monastic type life prayed the whole office which was longer at that time but in uh, in the city we were placed into ministries that uh, exposed us. We, out of the cocoon, you might say, as one of the mentioned uh, ministries was uh, the jail, and I mentioned that because that was what I did. I went to the, got my education, as I said, at the Jackson County Jail. Oh, boy. <laughs> How are you received there? Uh, when I went in, it was, of course, very reticent, very maybe fearful, but um, it just took a a few visits before they broke down and started relating and were very welcoming. We worked there for several years and were able to develop even activities for them. You know, we had a library ministry and I remember speaking with the sheriff to bring in sewing machines and I went begging fabrics and so they got busy rather than being idle, which is not very good for anyone. And, uh, and that even went developed into the uh, city jails, which is more misdemeanor type mm -hmm. things, and uh, as well as juvenile uh, detention homes. Mm -hmm. And that also um, was used by our summer programs. We had a lot of laity volunteer for summers, and we were able to introduce them to uh, church ministries or service of the church mm -hmm. through the, the basis that we already had. We did house-to-house um, -house visitation, and um, we did, uh, as they said, medical uh, ministries. In fact, at the time that we came to Kansas City, the inner city, there was a hospital, uh, a divided hospital, one for blacks, one for whites. Mm. So that was another thing that we did was... Where was this again? Kansas City, Missouri. All right. All right, listen, unfortunately we've run out of time of this segment. The tape was very good, but this is a two-part segment, uh, so please stay tuned next week. At this time, we'll do the second part with some other members of the society, and uh, we really appreciate your coming in to share some of this and want you to stick around and, and help us in the next go-around. So please, please tell your friends to uh, stay tuned at this time next week for the second half of the information on Society of Our Lady of the Most Holy Trinity a order established right here in New Mexico. So on behalf of everybody here at Spirituality, I'm Bill O'Donnell. Thanks for viewing. We'll see you next week for part two of Spirituality TV.